Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. It is our great privilege to come to be together as your body, to worship you in spirit and truth for the way that you have loved us, the way that you have saved us, adopted us, given us access to you. God, thank you for the gospel this morning. Thank you for your word that reveals Christ to us. And I pray as we open up Malachi chapter 2 that we would behold this Christ. We would see him in all his glory and be changed. God, help us to do that this morning by your spirit, by the power of your spirit to change us to be more and more like Christ. That's our heart's desire. Bless our time in your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's a time in parenting when your child does something really bad, sinful, unloving, horrible, and you take them aside to that special place of discussion and discipline, and you make your case. You call out the sin, and you give context for why this is wrong. That's Malachi chapter 1. If you decide as a parent that the discussion is going to be a stern warning, then you want to make it very, very clear that you are not pleased. And God is not pleased. And things must change now. Or there will be consequences. My dad used a very effective tool of the whisper voice. He would state his case. He would outline the consequences if things did not change. And then he would get down on my level and he would ask me, do you understand me? <laughs> and in that moment, there was real fear and real authority and real clarity. Yes, sir. That was the only proper response. That's Malachi chapter 2 that we're going to look at this morning. God is angry. He has stated his case in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. You, O priests, are despising my name. You're presenting defiled food upon my altar. You're giving me sacrifices that are blind and stolen and lame and sick and blemished. And all of it is evil. And the crescendo of chapter 1 concludes with God's defense of who he really is. Not who your sacrifices say that I am, but who I really am. Chapter 1, verse 14. I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name is feared among the nations. The book of Malachi is on fire. And we should treat it as such. This book is hot with rebuke. Because our God is the great king. And he is to be feared among the nations and among his people. Even, get this, even among us. As new covenant believers in Christ. God is still the same God of Malachi chapter 2. He's just interposed his mercy through the gospel. And he's appeased his own wrath at the cross so that you and I can call him father, so that we can draw near to him in love. But he's still the same God. And so there's great application for all of us in Malachi. Even though we're not under the old covenant, even though we're not under the leadership of old covenant priests, and we're not offering animal sacrifices, and so briefly, I want to give us two reasons the Levitical priesthood does not apply to us. And then I want, to give us, I want to give us two reasons it does apply to us. Establish some sense of relevancy to this chapter. The first reason that the Levitical priesthood does not apply to us is this. The old covenant is no longer in effect. There is no temple and no sacrificial system. There's no Levitical priesthood. It was destroyed in 70 AD. God has instituted a new covenant. 
And Hebrews is all about this transition and this fulfillment, specifically Hebrews 8 and, and chapter 9. Secondly, the second reason that the Levitical priesthood does not apply to us is that our great, great high priest has come in Christ. When Jesus is your priest, you don't need any other priest. A priest intercedes between two parties, between the divine and the human. And there in our perfect high priest, we have both. We have the God-man. Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Meaning Jesus accomplished what, what all priesthood is picturing. In Christ, we have our access to God through Christ and Christ alone, by faith. Christ is the great high priest, and no other priest can stand in between any other priest that claims any role in our salvation, in the forgiveness of sins, in helping or aiding Christ's finished work is simply unnecessary and ultimately heretical and unbiblical. Two reasons then that the Levitical priesthood does apply to us. While there's not a direct correlation from old covenant priesthood to new covenant pastors and elders, there's legitimate correspondence in these two areas. First, in terms of leadership ministry. The priests were leaders in the Old Covenant. They led in worship and temple sacrifice, and they shepherded the people. And secondly, in the teaching ministry of the Old Covenant. And so what is the relevance for you if you're not a priest and you're not a pastor? The relevance is this. If you're a Christian, you're going to be led by someone as you come underneath the authority of a local church. And since your soul and the soul of your family is of utmost importance, we need to know what faithful leadership looks like and how it functions because this is vital to your soul and your family's eternal well-being. And this chapter is not just about leadership. It's also about marriage faithfulness. This morning, I want us to see one overarching idea. When God's glory is not preeminent, leadership and marriage suffer. They fall apart. They're wrecked. When God's glory is not preeminent, our outline for this morning is this. It's simple. Verses 1 through 9, leadership matters. The sins of the priests, their awful sacrifices. And then secondly, verses 10 through 16, marriage matters. They were unfaithful in their marriages. They were divorcing their wives, and they were marrying foreign women, pagan women. And the remedy for both this morning is repentance from the heart, to see and respond to God as who he says he is and who he really is, glorious and supreme. For us, that means this morning we're going to come back to the gospel, to the supremacy of Christ in all things, for the glory of God in all things. So first, verses 1 through 9, leadership matters. In, the, in these verses, God harshly condemns heartless spiritual leadership. In verses 1 through 9, God speaks in the first person. In 10 through 16, Malachi speaks on God's behalf. And as Sean read, chapter 2 begins with great intensity. Verse 1, this commandment is for you, O priests. He calls out his audience. And verses 2 through 4 are nothing short of a divine threat. A call to the spiritual leadership of Israel to wake up. God's words are precise. They're graphic. They're severe, maybe in ways that are, we're not comfortable with. 
And he begins in verse 2, if you do not. It's a threat. It's a promise. It's a warning. But there's hope in it because it's conditional. If you do not. And there's three key phrases that fall after that in the first part of verse 2. If you do not listen, if you do not take it to heart, and if you do not give honor to my name, consequences will come. So first, listen. If you do not listen to me, God says to the priest, if you don't hear me, if you don't take me seriously, if you don't hear and do something about it, if you don't act on my words, if you do not listen and take it to heart, this word for take it to heart, is, it's visual. It's, it's, it's an excellent term. It means to lay something down, to set it down, to install it, to establish it in your heart. If you don't listen and take it to heart, God is not after ritual here. He's not after hollow obedience here. He's after and always will be their heart and your heart and my heart, which means you and I have to deal with the God of the universe heart to heart, personally. Whether you are an Old Covenant priest or you are a New Testament teenager or grandmother, that's what he's calling out in this text. God is after the heart. And so these two actions, to listen and to take it to heart, bring us to this one exalted purpose, to give honor to my name. God says, listen for this reason. The word is kabod. It's glory. To give glory to my name. To give weightiness to my name. You and I were designed for this. You and I were made in the image of God to give him the proper weight in the universe. That God is heavy compared to everything else. And because he is heavy, he is worthy. And sin has wrecked this. And so as we enter into this chapter and as we begin thinking about this kind of repentance, I want you to think about how heavy is God to you today? How glorious is the God of the universe to you today? And the only way that you can answer that question is from the heart. What you believe about this glorious God and then what your actions tell about your heart. You will do what you believe. That's where the truth lies of how you answer the question, how glorious is God? Not in your intentions, not in your excuses, but in your heart and in your actions. God without exception is the weightiest. He is the most glorious one in all the universe. And he is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. And the priests were falling far short. He says, if you don't, then I will. Judgment is coming in our context. Verse 2 continues. Then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I've cursed them already because you're not taking it to heart. Behold, I'm going to rebuke your offspring, your seed, your children, and I will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feasts, and you'll be, taking, you'll be taken away with it. Three consequences, three judgments. The first is curses. I will send the curse. I will curse your blessings. What you say for blessing, I'll turn into judgment. And the allusion really is to the covenant curses for disobedience. The old covenant, blessing, curse, cursing. Listen to Deuteronomy 28, 28, 15. But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And then the text goes on for 53 total verses of specific curses and judgments and consequences for disobedience. The old covenant was heavy with God's glory and the necessity of obedience. The second consequence is rebuke of the priest's children. Literally, their seed. And I I think, if anything, entering into this consequence, now we're getting personal. You're you're, going to talk about my children because of my unfaithfulness? 
And there's not a lot to go on in this context, but maybe the children are following in the priest's footsteps. It's not clear, but this is clear. The offense is so grievous that the consequences extend beyond the one generation. What you do will have a ripple effect to your children, generations to come. Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And then thirdly, refuse. God says, I will spread refuse on your faces. The refuse of your feasts. If talking about children was personal, these are fighting words. The word is awful, O-F-F-A-L. And it refers to the entrails and the bodily waste that would litter the area where animals had been sacrificed after a festival, after a feast. The contents of the gut, feces. Exodus 29, 14. But the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuse, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It's a sin offering. God says, I will spread it on your faces. What you bring to honor me, I will use to dishonor you. You offered it, but this is what I think of it. I'll put it in your face. And so I want us to pause and I want us to consider this particular consequence and ask some questions. Have we crossed some kind of line here? Has God crossed a line of propriety? Does God really say and does he really mean and intend that he will spread feces in the faces of these disobedient priests? That's disgusting. He would never do that, right? We would never do that. We would never permit our children from ever doing that. So what's going on here? I like numbers and lists. I want to give us four keys to understanding God's use of feces in the face. Words I never thought I'd use in a sermon. (laughs) Four keys to understanding this. Number one, is there any question that God is angry? There's no way. Refuse in the face. It's not soft language. Number two, is there any question who he's angry with? The refuse goes right into the face of the priests, the leaders of the nation. Number three, is there any question why he is angry with the priests? Because their heart is wrong, his glory is ignored. The sacrifices are evil. They're sinning against God. His name is not being honored. There's no question. He's angry, who he's angry with, and why he's angry. And then fourthly, is there any question from anyone's experience, from every culture and upbringing, that smearing refuse in someone's face is utterly disgusting? No, and that's the point. God is angry, and he's speaking in a way that is designed to make us very uncomfortable. Why? Why not just say, guys, guys, I'm mad here. Stop it. Because God wants to shock in this context with calculated words and images that are vile to us. To snap us to attention. He's provoking the priests to wake them up, to wake us up to what? To the often forgotten reality that our God is holy. And in the same way, you and I recoil and we find refuse in the face to be utterly disgusting. He finds lame worship and the diminishing of his glory infinitely more disgusting and offensive. How dare you put refuse in their faces? How dare we treat God as anything less than holy, holy, holy? This is holy rage. And it's visual, and it's descriptive, and it's graphic language to make the point. Is anyone not clear on the point? 
He's crystal clear, like the angry father who says, do you understand me? Yes, sir. God is the master communicator. He's the creator of life and breath and vocal cords and words and communication. And when he, when he elevates his tone and, when, and, and, and he elevates the severity of his language, don't rise above it and look down on it. Come under it and take it to heart by repenting and seeing him for who he really is. I think these words are actually beautiful when we consider what he's after. What is God after with this kind of language? He's after his glory and he's, and he's after the priest to take it to heart. Why? So that the people they lead can see that glory and so they can take it to heart too. There's actually mercy in the refuse language. God could have consumed the priest and judgment right then. You're dead. But instead... He appeals to them with this kind of language. That's mercy. Three inescapable points of application for this part. I'm not finishing. These are just three points of application. <laughs> Number one, to the pastors of Southside. God is holy, and so we must lead well. How many church leaders today in this world would God spread refuse in their faces because they're not listening to him? They're not taking his word to heart. I don't want to be one of those. I know every man I serve with here doesn't want to be one of those. We want to lead this congregation to a holy God. We want to point you to Jesus Christ through the faithful preaching and teaching of his holy word and live holy lives under the lordship of Christ. Secondly, for the church, for you guys, the church here at Southside, expect nothing less from church leadership. In this church, in any church that professes Christ, if you have friends that go somewhere else, lame leadership fuels lame churches and diminishes the glory of God and leads people away from Christ. Hold the biblical standard high. Be slow to encourage men to pursue leadership. Encourage them but be slow to encourage them because they're going to experience a stricter judgment. Know the qualifications for leadership in the church and hold every leader without exception to that standard and pray for them. Pray that God would raise up faithful leaders in our church. The priests in our context were in danger of dismissal. You're fired is the idea. The text says the refuse was taken outside the camp to be burned, and God says, I'll send you with it. So thirdly, application for heartless priests, rejoice. Rejoice that you and I have a high priest who was never dismissed, but who was exalted to the right hand of God, our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who could never have refuse smeared in his face because he's the sinless son of God. But get this, he chose to. He chose to be taken outside the camp with the refuse and be crucified there in the garbage dump for our sin. Turn to Hebrews 13, 10. Hebrews 13, 10. We have an altar <clears throat> from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Jesus went outside the camp to suffer shame for us to the garbage dump for the refuse. To die on a cross for our refuse. To that which is vile 
to our holy God, our sin. And so the author of Hebrews calls us to go out to him and bear his reproach. And to every Christian here this morning, we say to that, gladly. I'll go out to him by faith. I'll cling to him by faith. I'll suffer for him by faith. Why? Because he's worthy. He purchased me with his blood, and now I'm forgiven, and my life is altogether his. But not everyone here has gone out to him. Have you gone out to Jesus yet? Have you come to Jesus yet by going outside the camp to the shameful place of the cross and come face to face with the shame of your sin before a holy God, the refuse of your sin, the vileness of how we have treated this holy God. Because it's there that Jesus became sin for us and he died as our substitute so we could be wholly forgiven of the refuse of our sin. And we could be washed clean and we could be clothed in his righteousness. If there's one thing you listen to this morning and you take it to heart, it's this. You need Christ and you need, you need him desperately and you need him now and sin is serious and God is holy and there is a Christ. Believe him, receive him and he promises you personally Eternal life. Verse 4 of Malachi 2 continues. He says, Then you will know that I've sent this commandment to you, that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Verses 4 through 6 establishes the obligation of the covenant made with Levi. That the old covenant priest would come from his descendants and be God's own possession to serve in the tabernacle and the temple perpetually. The idea is this in our context. Unlike what you priests are doing, Levi did it right. Levi served well. He set the standard you should be keeping. And as we read these, I think there's, there's such correlation with the requirements for New Testament eldership in, in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. They, they just coincide very well. The text says of, the, of, of Levi that he had a high view of God. He revered me. He stood in awe of my name. It says that he was a faithful teacher. True instruction, instruction was in his mouth. Verse seven, lips, the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge. Men should seek instruction from his mouth for he's a messenger of the Lord of hosts. Thirdly, his life and his character were above reproach. Unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. And then fourthly, he shepherded others. He turned many back from iniquity. That is pastoral leadership in old covenant priesthood language. And if we take it to its final conclusion, it sounds like the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Faithful leadership is faithful Christ-likeness in any context. And so this section closes out in verse 8. But as for you, you've turned aside from the way, and you've caused many to stumble by the instruction. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I also have made you despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instruction. They turned away from God in faithfulness and obedience. They were unfaithful and disobedient. And they caused others to do the same. As leadership goes, most often the people will go. For any leader in the church, these are terrifying words. Jesus had similar words. For those who cause others to stumble. To the one who stumbles another believer, Jesus says, in Luke 17, it would be better for you to die horribly right now than to stumble one of these little ones. Luke 17, 1, he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were, thro and he were thrown into the sea 
than that, than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Leadership matters, doesn't it? It matters. And it only thrives when God's glory is preeminent. Our second heading this morning is marriage matters. Verses 10 through 16. When the glory of God is diminished, marriage faithfulness is wrecked. And we'll look at this one over all heading under the two headings of intermarriage and divorce. There's one key word all throughout this context, and it's the word treachery, if you're reading NAS. Unfaithfulness, to break faith. It's used five times to highlight the sins of the people. And it carries the idea of this. Unfaithfulness to your marriage is unfaithfulness to the covenant, therefore unfaithfulness to your God. God is a faithful God. He keeps covenant. And he expects the same of his people, particularly in the marriage covenant. When the glory of God is not preeminent, marriage unfaithfulness becomes the norm. And so Malachi begins in verse 10 by reasoning from God as creator and God as father to the covenant nation. And he asks this question, why do we deal treacherously with each other and profane the covenant? Another way of saying that is that there's a unity within the old covenant, same as there is with the new covenant. Though this is a saving covenant and that was not. And there's a unity. And the question is, if God is our father, if we are family, why don't we love each other? And he asks this question generally, and then he goes specifically, specifically to the treachery of intermarriage and divorce. So there's a lot that could be said about just covenant faithfulness to each other. But I don't have a lot of time. And so we're going to go right to marriage here. Verses 10 through 16. If you're reading ESV, you've probably thought, what, what, what Bible is he reading? There's very different translations of this chapter, especially 10 through 16. And here's, here's why. This is very difficult Hebrew. Honest commentators agree that we're simply hanging by a thread in lots of phrases in this context, putting these words together to understand the text. I asked them not to put ESV on the slides because it reads so differently from the NAS that I'm teaching. It just think, what, what is he talking about up there? But the general idea comes out the, the end of the chapter. And the general idea is this. Intermarriage and divorce are treachery, their unfaithfulness, and their sin, and God hates sin. And, and, and the expression of him hating that sin is he rejects their worship. So here's the first offense. The nation, whether a few or many, are marrying foreign wives. The sin of intermarriage. It was a spiritual problem. It wasn't, it wasn't about races. It was about that they, they didn't know the God of the covenant. It was a spiritual intermarriage. Malachi 2.10, do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. When they married pagan women who didn't know the God of the covenant, Against God's clear instruction in the law, Malachi calls on the Lord to cut them off from the people. Meaning this, intermarriage equals excommunication in the Old Testament. In verse 12, why? Because in verse 11, in verse 11 God calls it an abomination. God detested this practice. He hated this practice. It was loathsome in his sight. Because it was offensive to his holiness and it was dangerous for their souls. Deuteronomy 7.3. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. Why? For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will quickly destroy you. Marrying outside the covenant was sin. And it was dangerous. A one flesh relationship 
with someone who does not love God could turn your soul away to a false God and cost you your very soul. We won't turn there, but if you're taking notes, 1 Kings 11, 3 through 6. Some of those sobering words in all the Bible. King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived except for Christ. And what does it say of him in his later life? Lots of wives who didn't love God, who turned him away from the one true God. Verse 4 says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God. That's so sad. That's tragic. Are we any wiser than Solomon? This is so relevant to us today. Though we're not under the old covenant law, the new covenant is just as clear. Marry a Christian spouse. Don't be unequally yoked. What does light have to do with darkness? Marry in the Lord for his glory and you're good. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she's free to be married to whom she wishes. Only in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9, 5. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. So singles of all ages this morning. If you're a Christian... You simply cannot marry an unbeliever, nor should you want to. Not because God is out to sabotage your romance and keep you lonely perpetually, but because he's holy and marriage is holy and he cares for you and he's given you a new heart that loves Christ and loves his glory. Why would you join it to someone who does not? You're a child of God. In John 8, 42, Jesus says, if, his, if the Father is not your God, if, if God is not your Father, then Satan is your Father. How, how well is that going to work out? The union of a child of God and a child of Satan, what kind of fruit is that going to produce? To marry an unbeliever is to put romance over redemption. To choose a guy over God. To be enamored with a girl over God's glory. To do this, at least for a moment, you must set aside Christ. You must set aside his word because he clearly prohibits this old covenant and new. And so briefly, I want to give us 10 encouragements to pursue a Christian marriage. We'll go quickly. Number one. Number one. Marriage pictures the gospel. The relationship between Christ and the church. To marry an unbeliever violates the picture It's to join two unlike things into one. To join light and darkness, faith and unbelief. One pursuing the glory of God to one in rebellion to God. Number two, God cares about who you marry. And he cares about their spiritual condition for your sakes. And he's made it a moral issue tied to his very glory. So treat it as such. It's not an option Number three, beware of crazy excuses. Have you heard them? When a Christian allows themselves to pursue or be pursued by an unbeliever, they go nuts. They come up with the craziest excuses to justify why this is a good thing. Romantic love is a powerful force, but it's also a powerful deception. Because there's this desperate longing in people to be loved. But that love is only answered in Christ. It'll never be answered in some unbelieving spouse. Number four, don't underestimate the temptation and don't overestimate yourself. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Don't don't put that one away. Don't think, ah, no, I'd never do that. And then here comes Mr. Cutie. (laughs) And suddenly, you're about to fall. Mr. Cutie, I'm sorry. (laughs) Number five, don't marry potential. I think they're really close. They're going to make a great Christian someday. You don't marry potential. Someday, great. Leave them alone. Let God work that out in in their hearts so that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that person is born again and loves Christ more than you and always will. Number six, 
Surround yourself with people who love you enough to tell you hard things. I'm ashamed to say that in high school, I had a beginning of a little fledgling kind of relationship with a Mormon cheerleader, to my shame. And my youth group all but threatened to kill me. <laughs> And I'm so thankful they did. They were in my face. They were preaching to me. You can't do this. Are you nuts? Until I repented. Number seven, don't exchange the glory of God for a pretty face. Don't risk your soul for a pretty face. Grow strong in your faith. Be in his word. Be involved in the church. Grow to maturity so you will not be carried away by a good-looking man or woman who gives you special attention, wink, wink. Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Wait for her, wait for him. Their lives are praiseworthy. External, beauty, charm. There's a trickery to it and the world is good at using it. Number eight, guard your heart. With great intensity, fortify the wall around your heart so that you know your own convictions from the text. And so does everyone else. A person who does not love Christ cannot love God or you. Intermarriages are painful journeys. Number nine, fear extended time with unbelievers of the opposite gender that might pique your romantic interest in person. And this is the kicker. And also on social media. Social media does two things. It elevates and it worships relationships. And then it connects you, oftentimes secretly, with unbelievers who want to pursue you romantically. Put that to death. Kill your Instagram if that's your temptation. Murder your Snapchat. Delete the secular app, the secular dating app. That, and be really careful with the Christian ones too. And do this for God's glory and the good of your soul. Number 10, what could be better than this? Listen to your parents. I don't care whether you're... <laughs> listen to your parents. I don't care whether you're 12 or 50. Listen to your parents. Your parents love you. If they love Christ, they're going to tell you if, if, if she's a good one or if she's not. Second heading is marriage matters and divorce is unfaithfulness and treachery. This is the second subheading. Because Malachi's not finished, and like a machine gun, he keeps coming. Look at verse 13. There's another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? The question is, why don't you accept my worship? Malachi says, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. There's so much here to unpack. I'll speak generally. We don't have a lot of time, but divorce is so complicated in the Bible. Not all divorce is the same. There's guilty parties. There's victims of divorce, but all divorce ends the one flesh relationship. And that is not its design. Its design is to picture the gospel, which is a love relationship between, between Christ and his bride, the church, which never ends. All divorce brings pain. All divorce brings sin of some sort out of somebody. And if you're a Christian and you've been divorced, please know that God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate you. It's not the unforgivable sin, and there is grace, and there is healing and forgiveness. The New Testament specifies three reasons that end the marriage covenant. Death in Romans 7, abandonment in 1 Corinthians 7, and immorality in Matthew 19, sexual uncleanness. But Malachi isn't addressing these biblical reasons. He's addressing this, the selfish abandonment of their wives to marry foreign women. Midlife crisis kind of, see ya, honey, she's younger, see you later. 
Simple, sinful unfaithfulness, the treachery of leaving her behind. Matthew 19, 5, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And so as we close, three encouragements to remain faithful to your wife in light of the new covenant. Number one, marriage pictures the gospel. Divorce trashes the picture. As if Jesus would ever leave us. As if he would ever abandon his bride, the church, the one for whom he has died. Jesus is faithful, so we must be faithful to our spouses. The gospel is at stake in your marriage. And so men, love your wives. Women, love your husbands. Number two, God hates divorce, and so should we. In a world that could care less about marriage and divorce, we must hate what God hates. And if God hates divorce, he also hates that which leads to divorce. Unforgiveness, stubbornness, pride, distance, strife, pornography, adultery, spiritual apathy. If we hate divorce, we will fight to put to death these sins that lead to divorce and fight for our marriage. And then thirdly and finally, marriage faithfulness affects worship. Notice in, in, in the Malachi context how the marriage status is tied to old covenant offerings and sacrifices. If you marry outside the covenant, if you divorce your spouse, God will not accept your worship. With their foreign wives in tow, having divorced their Jewish wives, they cry out, why aren't you accepting our offerings? And Malachi answers so powerfully, why does God reject your offerings? Because when you got married the first time, God says, I was there and I witnessed it and I joined you together and you've been unfaithful to the companion of your youth and to the covenant marriage and therefore to me. The marriage relationship is so sacred that unfaithfulness to your spouse, treachery toward your wife, causes God to reject your worship. You cannot live the Christian life without giving sacrificial covenant priority to your spouse. God takes that covenant you made and what it represents very, very seriously. Old covenant and new covenant so that I can't step over my wife to pursue godliness. You can't leave them behind. You can't ignore them. You can't deal treacherously with them and live a life that's pleasing to God. It's not happening. You are a one flesh relationship. And God says he was there. And he joined you together. Your life to theirs. Someone can say, oh, that's Old Testament. Come on. All this marrying foreign women, rejecting worship, that's Malachi. I don't even read minor prophets. 1 Peter 3, 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Christian husbands, this morning, love her, Live with her, honor her, or God says, shut the door. God doesn't want to hear from you when you offer up your prayers. He's not listening. When you go to speak with your God, your prayers will be prevented, is the word. The line of communication is shut off. What could be harsher discipline than radio silence from the God of the universe for a Christian? How do you live the Christian life that way? How do you pray without ceasing when God isn't listening to you? My guess is that you can't. It's wrecked. It's on a permanent hold, and that's the point. Christ is priority number one, and then your spouse. And marriage is so important that if you're unfaithful with number two, number one isn't listening. You can't get on your knees to commune with the living Christ if you're not loving your wife. And your companion. Wives, love your husbands. The context of 1 Peter 3 seems to indicate the same thing applies to you. 
that God is not listening to any of us, not treating each other faithfully. So this morning as we close, what do you do if your marriage stinks? What do you do if there's distance and you're drifting and maybe divorce is even on the table? What are you to do and where are you to go? We're coming to the table this morning. And I want to invite you, if you have a distant marriage, to come to the cross of Christ and remember that cross where our husband, Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us, where he took our sins and he nailed them to the cross and he took them out of the way so that you and I could have eternal life now and forever. It is the glory of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every sin that's wrecking your marriage is forgiven sin, powerless sin. But somehow, one or both of you has lost sight of the glory of God. And to save your marriage, to grow your marriage, you need help. You need power. You need grace. And the cross is the only place that you're going to find that. There's not a gimmick, there's not a counselor, there's not a therapist that can change your heart to then change your marriage. But God can. And that power that raised Christ up from the dead, the very power of God, is the same power at work in you to love your spouse. How hopeful is that? And to get your marriage back on track. And so let's get our eyes back on the glory of God through the lens of the table this morning because God hates divorce and he loves marriage and he loves the things that grow a marriage. Things like humility and repentance. Repent to God and repent to your spouse. Some of you need to say to your spouse, I've been stepping around you to try to live the Christian life. And our hearts have to beat as one on this journey because we are one. And Jesus will heal your marriage. For two broken sinners who will look to Christ, there is hope, hope, hope. There's sufficient grace and there's strength and weakness. Jesus is our great high priest and he leads well. He leads perfectly. And he is our faithful bridegroom and he loves well, and he is faithful. And he never once dealt treacherously with us, and he never will. He's going to be faithful to us to the very end. He'll never divorce us. Jesus is the greatest husband that you and I could ever ask for. And the cross is the seal of that marriage covenant. And so this morning, let's thank him for the cross. Let's worship him for who he really is our holy God, our great King, the Lord of hosts, the one to be feared among the nations and feared, it's outside Bible church, but a fear that draws us close to him because the judgment has been taken out of the way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithful leadership over us all our days. Thanks for your covenant love through the blood of Christ to us in giving us your son and him laying down his life so that we could have life. And so as we turn our attention to the table now, we pray that you would help us. You would help us remember appropriately by faith to be encouraged and built up as we consider the cross. God, I pray for every marriage here this morning, that there be a deep love for Christ and love for each other, and that each marriage would reflect that oneness in every way. God, I pray that you would give courage to struggling marriages. You would give, give courage to struggling believers to come once again to the cross, believe the gospel and then go live a life that's worthy of the gospel. Thank you for your spirit to lead us in that, to empower us to do that. And God, in all these things, I pray that you would give us great hope this morning. 
Great that our sins, great hope that our sins are covered and there's hope for our marriages. God bless our time now as we remember. In Jesus' name, amen.